Hi, and welcome. Today we're talking with Danielle Sibulski. She is the host of the Medieval Podcast, as well as the author of Life in Medieval Europe, Fact or Fiction. As you know, I love talking to scholars, students, academics, amateurs, podcasters, and so many more. My name is Rosie. I'm a Francophone from Canada, and this is my podcast. Now it's time to dig into some medieval history, eh? Today, I'm really excited. I'm talking with Danielle Sibulski. She is a fellow podcaster. She's also an author, so that's pretty exciting. And I just want to say thank you for being here. I'm so excited you're here. You and I'm really happy to be here. So thanks for the invitation. Actually, how about I ask you if you can present your topic? Sure. So I am a person who studies everyday life in medieval Europe. And for me, that's the usually the later part of the Middle Ages, so the high to late Middle Ages. We're talking after the Norman Conquest, which is in 1066, to for me, the end of the Middle Ages is around 1500. So I like to bring to people the really interesting stuff about the Middle Ages because I, I know that in school we learn a lot of dates and kings and stuff like that, but everybody wants to know what it was actually like to live there. So I like to dig up stuff about the real human life there. So what do people eat? What do they wear? What was it like to actually be there? And that's that's what I study and that's what I work with. That's so fun. I mean, you know, when we look at books, like you said, there's so many dates and people and we kind of get lost in that and not understand that, you know, they were human and they were real people. Yeah, exactly. They're real people to me. So I like to dig into the things that they think about or the things that they write about. What is it that actually interested them? Because we, if we look at history kind of big picture, we forget about the individuals. You know, we forget about the person who just went to work and what were they thinking when they were at work or what were they thinking about this person that might like them or not like them. So just a real human story. And so that's what I look at when I look at history. I try and see the individuals as much as possible, which is tricky with the Middle Ages because, you know, if it's not somebody who's part of the aristocracy, we might not know all that much about them. But those are the stories that really interest me. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'd love to know, how did you get interested in this topic? What brought you here? Um, I've realized that the short answer is Disney. <laughs> So when I was a kid, I loved Sleeping Beauty. I still love Sleeping Beauty. And that's really, it's not only like a fairy tale, which many of them are set in the Middle Ages. And actually, one of my favorite lines from the movie is Prince Philip says, this is the 14th century nowadays, <laughs> but it's based on 14th century art. So that really captured my imagination. And then the other one was Disney's Robin Hood. I mean, that fox, he's amazing, right? So between the two, I was really hooked. And then my parents were into Tolkien and uh, Tennyson and stuff. So I learned a lot about Arthur and Robin Hood and stuff when I was growing up. And it, it really captured my imagination. So I went to school and, and learned a lot about medieval stories and literature. Um, but the more you the more you want to understand a culture like that, the more you have to understand what it was like for the people who are reading it. So I kind of got more and more into the history aspect of it. And that's that's what led me here. Absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah. You never know how you're going to get somewhere and why you're going to get interested in it. But then you fall on something as simple as, you know, castles and kings and in a cartoon. And it makes sense. I know it's not a sophisticated answer. Like, I remember this is years ago, uh, sitting with a bunch of academics at a table at a conference. And, you know, they were they were talking about how did you get into it and stuff. And they seemed to want to hear an answer that was sophisticated like you know I read Thomas Aquinas and I realized but, but the real answer was I, I got interested in it from the stories in childhood and so the work that I do I do a lot of writing for medievalist.net I do the medieval podcast I always come to it with the idea that we're interested in the stories the stories of people and the stories they wrote and so there's no shame in that. So I actually said and said, I dropped that bomb. You know, I was interested in it because of Disney. But everybody related to that because I think we don't come to the Middle Ages from, you know, having read the rules of St. Benedict. We come at it from Robin Hood or from King Arthur or things like that. That's okay. We all have our own journey, right? 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's probably people who read Thomas Aquinas and then want to become medieval scholars, but it wasn't me. <laughs> I guess we can start with the start. So what would a normal day be like during, you know, that 14th century? Yeah, the 14th century is my favorite century um, because it's full of disasters. So like war and plague and things like that, which I think we can relate to in a lot of ways now. What I like about it is how resilient people were and how they how they dealt with these problems. But to to figure out everyday life, you have to find like a typical person, which is not all that easy to do. So if you think of a noble person, maybe what I can talk about uh, for a second is what people don't understand that that noble people had to deal with. And so when you think about a knight, for example, he's going to go through his day. He's going to um, he's going to practice fighting. He's going to actually make sure he's honing his martial skills. So knights have to make sure they're great with horsemanship. They have to make sure they're great with weapons and things like that. Um, but they also are usually lords or aristocrats, which means they have to deal with the everyday life of their their land holdings. So that means that they have to deal with their tenants and what their tenants are asking them to do. The petitions from their tenants, they have to go and ride around and make sure everything is fine. Because in exchange for the tenants living on the land, um, the Lord has to protect them and he has to take care of them. So there's administrative stuff that we don't actually imagine knights are doing, but they are doing that kind of stuff as well. And for ladies, we picture them just sewing all day, right? Just doing embroidery. But they are the people that, if the knights are the people or lords or the people that are taking care of the outside world, the women are taking care of the inside world. So they're the ones that make sure, even if they're high status ladies, they're making sure that the household is running properly, properly so they know where everybody is, what they're doing, how many supplies they have, are they ready in case, you know, the king comes to visit, do they have everything they need to do? And so there's a lot of kind of work that goes into their everyday that maybe you don't picture and there's a lot of habits that we don't picture them having perhaps like they do clean their teeth they do bathe <laughs> maybe not every day but these are things that they do in their regular life and they read and they read to each other and they take the time to play games and they take the time to sing so when you think about people in the middle ages um, I think we think of them in stereotypes, and that's kind of fair because it's how we're raised. But you really want to think about what do they do during their everyday? Well, they talk to people, and they eat, and they clean their teeth, and they brush their hair, and they pick their outfit. Um, and these are the type of things that we may not picture, but this is part of the typical everyday, just like it would be for a person today. I mean, they're not just fighting all day, and they're not just sewing all day. And I think that's the picture that we get because in media, that's – they're – trying to tell a story in a short amount of time so you use just kind of symbols <laughs> the woman with her embroidery hoop and the man with his sword but they're actually people who are having discussions and planning things and and writing letters that kind of thing so yeah so the typical day like that that's more like on the western side of europe i guess or did they have differences across europe yeah that's a good question so in europe the um if we if we're thinking of like the structure of society. It was still the same as it would be in England. So you'd have people on farms. Most of the people are farmers. Most of the people are peasants. And then there's aristocrats above them who are um, the ones who are in charge of the land and in charge of the rules of law and things like that. They didn't have like a police force like we do now. So it was, you know, every lord for himself in a way taking care of business. So it was the same in Eastern Europe in terms of political structure. But there are differences, for example, in religion um, and things like that. And of course, language, which are not the same. Um, and so there's there's some difference. Also, it's not the same as the countries that we have now. It was smaller little groups of lords or kings and things like that. And so the rules would be different. Um, and the toleration of difference would be different across the board as well but when you think about the basic political structure of lords and peasants yeah that was that was across europe you mentioned that a lot of them were farmers so when it came to farming what was the typical i know it's i keep saying typical <laughs> it's a difficult thing but sort of what was the typical running of a farm yeah well in the same way you'd have the men who were taking care of the stuff that was outside the home and the women who are taking care of stuff that was inside the home so it's it's kind of what you picture in that you'd have to get up with the sun and you'd have to eat and then 
the men would go out. So um, for people like you and I are Canadians and our growing season is much shorter, but for Europeans, it's longer. So much of their time would be taking care of the fields, right? You, It's a constant thing as a farmer going out there and taking care of the fields, especially when, you know, you're not using a tractor, you're using a horse and plow. And actually our word acre comes from how long it would take to do this amount of this amount of plowing in one day. So that's how they measured it. So a man is going out and he's taking care of the farm. And, you know, hopefully you have a bit enough of space that you can feed yourself. And part of that um, crop that you're growing is going to the Lord as well as part of your agreement with him. And then the women are doing everything else. <laughs> so during their day, they're going to be taking care of animals. They're going to be taking care of children. They're going to be taking care of food, um, textiles as well. Hopefully they'll have time to visit with friends while they're sewing or while they're, you know, making cheese or whatever. But yeah, women are taking care of all of the things. And there's actually poems in the Middle Ages where there's men who are complaining, like, our lives are so hard and we never finish all of our tasks. And the women are like, do you want to trade for a day? Because <laughs> I have been up with the sun. I've been up with the baby all night. I'm doing all the things and all you have to do is take care of the field and that's it <laughs> and there's one of these poems which i think is like really fantastic but they decide to switch for a day but the end of the poem is lost so we don't know what happens <laughs> but yeah uh, if you're a peasant your whole day is basically taking care of the things that you need to do because everyone take everything takes longer you don't have fridges you know, we do have markets, but we don't have a grocery store, you know, um, and you have to create every single stitch of clothing that you're wearing unless you have the money to buy it, which is going to be fairly rare. So their entire day during the day is going to be um, doing the things that are necessary for survival. That said, they do have time to play games and sing songs and tell stories, especially after the workday is done. Like once the sun's going down, you can't really work. So this is a time for leisure. They also had a lot of holidays. That's uh, their holy days. That's where our word comes from. And they weren't allowed to work on those days. So on holidays and Sundays, they weren't working. They were playing sports and games and things like that. So a peasant's life was difficult and it was full of work, but it wasn't completely work. And in and among those things, you have to think of it being a social thing as well. Even when we're working or when we were working, we could go to the water cooler same thing for people in those days. So even though we picture their life and all of the tasks they have to do during the day being really full and a lot of work, they also had a life like we do. So I wanted to make sure that we, we get that in there as well. I feel like if we think about any of the storytelling that happened, you know, in all these oral traditions with, I'm guessing some of the people weren't literate. So how do you keep those traditions going? They have to talk about it sometimes. So that's a really good point. Yeah, I remember talking to someone about um, Chaucer. This is years ago. And they were saying, well, this person's a peasant. Like how would they know the Canterbury Tales? And the truth is that people didn't have copies of the Canterbury Tales. So Canterbury Tales came out in 14th century and the printing press came out in the 15th century. So all of these are hand handcrafted manuscripts. Everything is written by hand which means that not everybody has a book club with novels, right? Like even in the palace, you have people reading out loud. And when you think about this, like Chaucer or someone else reading out loud to the court, it's not just aristocrats who are sitting there that can read. There are people who are serving the food and they can hear the stories and then they can tell their friends and their friends can tell their friends. So even if you have something that is, you know, aimed at a literate public, doesn't have to stay there people are telling stories to each other because well, they're human beings like how how often do you retell a juicy story or tell about a movie that you saw to your friends it's the same type of thing yeah absolutely that makes so much sense right that these stories <laughs> were able to be propagated a whole different in a whole different medium essentially yeah even if they were written down so I guess we looked at their everyday life, talked a little bit about storytelling, because I guess that's that's part of their life also. And you said they played games. Do we have an idea of what types of games they played? Yeah, yeah, we do. And they're going to be familiar. <laughs> um, they played chess. Actually, chess came to Europe 
from India through the Middle East to Europe. And so that is a game that they had elephants in the Indian version and they became bishops <laughs> in in Europe, which, you know, makes sense with the worldview. But they had checkers. They had um, nine men's Morris uh, and backgammon was a favorite game as well. So they had all of those games, board games. In the later Middle Ages, they also had card games, especially with as the printing press came, you could have more card games going into the early modern period. But yeah, card games as well. Dice games, because they've had those forever. So you could play dice games too. But they also had sports. So in the 14th century, especially if, you, if you're looking at England, the King Edward III, he was in a war with France, so he made sure that everybody did archery. So every week you had to do archery practice. So there's that as a sport that you could do. They also played soccer or football. Um, they played an er early version of golf. <laughs> I think it was called golf, so very close. But yeah, they played all sorts of games, um, things that are lost to us now. But yeah, basically backgammon, chess, and checkers, those sets that you still get. Those are those are hundreds and hundreds of years old, and people enjoyed them then. Enjoy them now. I still like a good game of backgammon. <laughs> yeah, I feel like these games are timeless. <laughs> yeah, because they're pretty easy. I mean, you only you only need to have a stick to draw in the dirt and some rocks, and you've got a checkerboard. It's simple. And I I do want to emphasize that like they weren't like just digging in the dirt for their games. They had actual like chess pieces and checker pieces and stuff but the point is that these games can spread rapidly and you can play them easily because you don't need a lot of stuff to do it absolutely they were farmers they love to play games and you said there was a lot of upheaval during this period so did you want to talk a little bit about what happened and how they dealt with it in their everyday life yeah well um so the 14th century is a time when there was a shift in the weather. So this shift in the weather uh, is probably possibly responsible for the Black Death in a lot of ways. So at the beginning of the 14th century, there was a lot of famine across Europe. So that's already a terrible time. This is in, if I have my dates right, it's around 1320, maybe a bit before, maybe a bit after. Um, so there's famine. That's a terrible time. And then... Um, there starts to be unrest in Europe because the king of England, Edward III, his mom was French and his mom's family dies out. And so Edward thinks I should be the king of France too. So he tries to make a claim to France, which of course the French are not into because they don't want to have somebody from England on the throne. So this starts the Hundred Years' War. So that's already in motion and starting to get into motion when all of a sudden, from the east comes the Black Death, and uh, that arrives through ships. You can actually trace it. We can now, with, with DNA testing, trace the strains of the Black Death, but that swept across Europe, and it killed anywhere between a third to a half of the population, depending on where you are. So people compare this to COVID-19, and it's not the same at all. When you think about, if you look around your house or your neighborhood, and you picture every second person is gone, for every third person, that's a huge difference. So the entire the entire continent is going through a lot of trauma at this time. And the thing about the Black Death that people also don't realize is it came back in waves um, all the way up to the 20th century. And it actually still exists right now, but we have antibiotics for that. So if you're traveling around in Arizona or something, you could catch the Black Death, but you'll survive it because you'll get antibiotics. So it's a very traumatic time for people. So you're trying to figure out like, how did they deal with it? And sometimes you get chronicles where there are people, there's one uh, monk that says, this is the end of the world. But then you have people like Chaucer who mentioned it, I think once, in passing. Then you have in Italy, you have Boccaccio who starts his Decameron, which is about people who are fleeing the Black Death. So you have all these different ways in which people are dealing with it. And one of the things that I think maybe your listeners don't realize is that people um, really cared for each other and they really understood how to care for each other in ways that maybe we don't think of now. So if you think not only just of the care that you have to provide for people when everybody's sick, that's difficult. You had a lot of priests, for example, who are going, taking care of the sick and dying from this. But you have a lot of war at this time, too. And 
people are coming back from war with disability and they're being taken care of. So you have people coming back with PTSD, you have people coming back with injuries and the community is taking care of them as best they can. And I like to see this, that again, that human element. So if you have someone who's coming back, for example, with a head wound and their personality is all of a sudden different, there is an acceptance of that. And there are contingency plans in place for that. For example, like the, the relatives will take care of the property until this person recovers. Or if they don't recover, they'll take care of it until the heirs are old enough, or it'll go into the, the possession of the king and he will administer it. So just the way that people come together and they take care of each other, even in the midst of disaster, is what I find fascinating about the 14th century. So yeah, famine, plague, and war all in the same century. It was a crazy time, and I would never want to visit it. But it's interesting to me <laughs> how people dealt with it. Yeah, again, you're benching that human element. It's so important to look at it. I mean, they didn't just live in the books, right? They had everyday lives that they had to deal with, you know, these injuries and all these other problems that we might not consider. It's great. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Monty Python view, and it's funny because those guys actually studied the Middle Ages, they know what they're talking about. And so the more you know about the Middle Ages, the funnier the Holy Grail is. But I mean, you have these pedants that are collecting filth. <laughs> and it's a joke because, you know, that's how we see them. We don't think of what they did all day. We don't think of what they did when, you know, their loved one came home from war and they were traumatized. We don't think about that. But the truth is that there were human beings that were dealing with that. And I want to know more about them, how they do that. And that's, that's where I like to dig into history. And I guess talking about sickness and taking care, uh, do we have an idea of what the medicine was like? Was anything effective? Did anything work? Or was it all just unfortunately not advanced enough? Well, unfortunately, it was not advanced enough. So we we look back to the Middle Ages and we think it was because they were dirty or whatever. That's the reason. And in a way, they deserved it because they were too dumb to know how to take care of it. But like I said, no one was able to keep this down for centuries. And I mean, there the same the same um, disease came around centuries before the Black Death. This was just the worst example of it. So what did they do for medicine? They tried everything they could. So I think that the first recourse is, is prayer. So they did do that. But I mean, we do that now, right? There's people who are praying to, to not get COVID, for example. What else did they do? Well, the medical theory at the time suggested that bad smells would cause disease. And in a way, that's not too far off because it's... The idea is that it's the air, it's the corrupted air that's causing disease. And we know that it does, actually. <laughs> but they thought it was stuff that you could actually like smell, like detect. So what they were doing was they did come up with stuff like you've heard of like pocket full of posy. That um ring around the rosy is not medieval, but that idea was around where people would try and smell things to not smell this miasma, this bad smell as well. They would try and do that. They did do things like bloodletting if they could or using leeches to try and get rid of corrupted blood. Um, but basically nothing worked. There was nothing that worked. And when you think about it, there are so many diseases that antibiotics can take care of really quickly and nothing else will do it. And that was what, what happened at the time. So the best thing that people could do is quarantine, but we know from today that's really hard to enforce and you have to get everybody on board and you have to make contingency plans for how people can survive in quarantine so it i mean it no one can no one could control it so they tried everything and i think people laugh sometimes at the maybe the the cures that they tried to come up with but i and i do say this elsewhere if every second person is dying, you'll do anything. You'll try anything. And I do. we see this now with COVID, right? You try anything to stop it. And that's what they did. So, I mean, some of the, some of the remedies might sound silly. Um, this isn't a Black Death one, but there's one that's like suggesting you with people with porpoise skins. That's weird. But when you think, <laughs> when you think about it, you're going to do whatever it takes. Um, yeah, so quarantine would have worked the best if they could manage it. 
But at the same time, the Black Death spared some villages and not others. So we, we're still learning about how that worked, how it spread. Um, and that research is actually helping us now when we're thinking about epidemic disease. Yeah, it's quite surprising how we can look that far back into history and hopefully get some insight. Yeah. And the DNA testing and tracing shows us how that particular disease mutated and how it spread. And um, it's it's giving scientists who are smarter than me about this stuff <laughs> um, a lot more insight in how things do spread from human to human. Yeah. That's very interesting. I guess a lot of people don't consider that going, you know, far into the medieval ages would be very handy for today's world. Yeah, there are so many things that we uh, we need the medieval world for. I mean, we the idea of quarantine, right? We need to separate people. I don't think that that is medieval per se, but that word is, um, as far as I understand it. Um, but things like eyeglasses, things like the shape of the book, table of contents, red letter days, you know, um, water wheels, buttons, the printing press mechanical clocks. These are all things that we owe to the Middle Ages. And people will think it's a very backward time or they'll say it's a time when like there was no science. It's dark ages. Well, the dark ages means we don't have a lot of sources from that time. It doesn't mean that it was a time when, you know, science slept or, you know, history went backwards. Uh, it's a mistake to think that history is a march upward over time, like towards us as the pinnacle. <laughs> I think that, you know, if you look at the news today, maybe you'll see that it's not always a march upwards so towards progress. But it was a time with, with huge amounts of innovation. You just think of like, if you put yourself in that time, how would you deal with situations? That's how they dealt with situations too. It seems as though it's very raw and they're just trying to invent and adapt to new situations. Yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily raw as in like they're just like wandering around the bush and collecting filth because there's like a huge sophisticated society, right? People are writing amazing poetry and stuff like that. There's um, just the so much intellectual knowledge and stuff that again, if you trace back, you find in the Middle Ages, this is where people are thinking really deeply about stuff. But when you think about, yeah, um, the elements you do have to deal with, you know, your survival first. And that is more difficult than it is for most of us now. You know, we can assume that we will have a place to live. It's not going to fall down where back in the day you had to do that yourself. You had to figure that out yourself. So in a way, it's raw in that way. But I don't want people to think that they were just kind of like wallowing in mud. And that coming up with the wheel, you no, know, that was like thousands and thousands of years before this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean it that yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> I meant it more, you know, like, um, uh, like the water wheel or, you know, different mills and different techniques for grinding grain maybe, or stuff like that. I mean that if I'm not mistaken, does come from that time period, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's mills that are made with water and stuff like that using water, uh, in the Roman period. So that's earlier, but they did, I think the water wheel is a medieval invention and it was, hugely effective you know it made it made everything a lot faster and more efficient uh, a couple of other inventions that they just improved upon were the spinning wheel this is something that just hugely uh increased production which made it so much easier than using a drop spindle you know the production was a lot better things like the horizontal loom because before this people were weaving on a vertical loom uh, people still did that um, and people were doing it in the viking age but like later parts uh later parts of the Middle Ages, they had horizontal looms, which again, were so much faster because I don't know if you've seen a loom before, listeners, but you just, you can shoot the shuttle across and it's a lot, lot faster than trying to do it vertically. So that kind of innovation, even if they're not, you know, inventing it from scratch, they invented some stuff from scratch, like eyeglasses, but the improvements that they made upon technology, like water mills, like looms, like spinning, those things were, were, I mean, we wouldn't be where we are without them. Absolutely. I love the innovation that they had, you know, using what they had <laughs> at hand. Yeah, it's smart. It's you, it, looking at a process that you think this could, we could do this better. How do we do this better? And I mean, this is, this is just human beings being curious about things and trying to make their lives easier <laughs> 
or just seeing if they could do it. Like, can I do this? When I think about the Mariners, for example, they didn't think that the Earth is flat, by the way. They didn't think they were going to sail off the edge. They knew it was round. They calculated based on that. Um, and they, they charted their courses based on the fact that it was a sphere. And it, that falls apart right away, by the way. If you, you try and look at, do people think the Earth is flat? No, that falls apart right away. But the sheer audacity of saying, let's just go out and see how far we get. Like, this is, I think it's amazing when you have these, these humans being so curious and adventurous and just wanting to see what they can do. And um, we still, we're trying to do that still, trying to get to the stars or trying to get further underwater or trying to improve processes that we have now. And I just like that human spirit and seeing it happen. And if I'm correct, because I took a medieval class a while ago from that time period, but isn't it around this time that the guilds were being built and settled where that industry section was sort of growing? Yeah, so they did have guilds, especially and those guilds were they were important in so many ways because they not only um, made it so that you could have a whole bunch of people with the same skills learning from each other you have like masters and apprentices this is this is old but it became kind of official with guilds and things like that um, but the guilds also they made sure that the prices were fair they made sure that the measurements were fair so that you know from place to place you weren't being scammed this is in part because of the guilds um, the guilds also took care of each other so the guilds would collect money from their members so that if one of their members became sick or became impoverished or something, the guild would support them as a member into their old age. And so, yeah, the guilds were really important and they start to really establish and solidify in the 14th century. You can, we have more records for them too. I think that especially in London, we have quite a lot of records for the guilds. So you can actually search, I think, on the internet and see if one of your relatives was a member of a guild in London and it's, it's cool it's nice to see how these groups work within the town and as individuals and I should mention that usually women were not at the forefront of industry they were usually the people who were in the back room doing a lot of the work right? but they usually couldn't be masters but in many cases, they could be masters. And so there are guilds, for example, embroiderers, guilds in Paris that have a lot of women members who are masters in the guild. So we don't want to forget about them. So the guilds, mostly men, um, but women involved too. And there's actually there's one more cool thing to mention about the guilds, and that is in the Middle Ages, they didn't have a lot of professional actors, right? So you might have minstrels who are going around that have acrobats that have a lot of skills and things like that. But they didn't have actors putting on plays in a playhouse. That's not something that happened in the Middle Ages. They did have plays, but the plays were usually Christian plays and they were usually put on by the guilds. And so you'd have, you know, farmer, not farmer, but like Baker Joe would be in a guild a play every year to celebrate well, in England, Corpus Christi, a certain feast um, of Jesus. So it was cool because they would give out each part, each part of this Christian story to a different guild. So Noah's Flood, for example, they would give that play to the uh, Shipbuilders Guild and they would put that on every year. And they would have like the Garden of Eden. They would give that to the grocers because the grocers had the apples. And so the guilds, I think that we think of them in terms of just business, but they also actually put on plays, which I think is just awesome. That's definitely not something I had ever heard. <laughs> yeah, it's cool, right? <laughs> So you also, you did mention women a little bit. So in the medieval world, we have sort of an idea of their everyday life and their possible involvement to some level in guilds. Now throughout Europe, and maybe, I don't know if you know a bit about the East also, but what were some of the Roman, women's roles uh, in the medieval time? Um, their most important role was supposed to be supporting men, but that meant a whole lot of different things. So. Um, Queens, for example, I mean, you have the king and he's going to um, his council and he's hearing advice from his council, but he also is going to bed with the queen and they're going to have a discussion about what's going on. So sometimes queens would have more uh, power than you might imagine, sometimes because they were the mothers of the heir or the best friend of the king. Some of the relationships between kings and queens are really solid and we shouldn't forget about that. The queen also had a really 
um, symbolic role in that she was supposed to be the mild one. So if the king had to like put out some harsh justice, but he didn't really want to, then the queen could go up and say, you know, I beg you to have mercy. And, and the king could do that without losing face. So that's a really important function for queens. But medieval women were actually more, I don't want to say liberated, but they had more rights than we imagine. And they had more rights than a lot of the women before and after. So when you were married, you were the property of your husband. He could discipline you physically, but this rule of thumb is a myth. That's not how it went. But he was not allowed to go too far. And the neighbors would, they would step in if, if a man went too far in quote unquote disciplining his wife. Um, she could leave him if he was abusive. They would not be able to divorce, but she could live away from him. She could also, um, she could also ask for an annulment if they couldn't have children together. She could ask for that. Or if he didn't want to be part of the relationship in that way, she could ask for an annulment. So she could separate that way. When you became a widow in much of medieval Europe, and again, the East is not, not my specialty, but I think that this kind of applies there too. When you became a widow, then you had more autonomy. And most widows didn't remarry. <laughs> they didn't want to remarry because they might have more um, control over their land in some places. They might have control over their destiny in some places. Um, they could take their skills and they could go to a convent if they wanted. Like they, a lot of nobles could read. The women could read. And where do they? Where do you find the books? You find them in convents. So they might do that as well. And also. In a time like the 14th century, when there were more frequent battles, and again, people are not fighting every day, but there were more frequent battles at that time. I mean, who was in charge? I've already said, like, the men are in charge of the stuff outside of the house. Women are in charge of the stuff inside the house. This means everything from, like, running it when their husbands are away, which might happen a lot if he had a lot of property, if he went on crusade, if he went out fighting. They're in charge of everything. They're also in charge of defending their place. And so you have stories of women who are defending their lands, you know, in, in very literal terms. <laughs> they might be taking up arms themselves, probably from, from the walls. But they were in charge of all sorts of stuff. And you, you see them um, making rules or judgments over the peasants in their own names, especially in southern France. So women had a lot of roles. They had a fair amount of autonomy when we think about like history broadly but they um they had a lot of influence that we may not imagine that they did not only in the bedroom like and i mean this is conversations that you're having with your husband who might have more power than you but also when when they're widowed for example so yeah they are really interesting the women of the middle ages and they're also often sidelined or ignored. They're thought of as like the damsel in the tower. And really they had a fair amount of agency and their clothing was a lot more comfortable <laughs> than the Victorian clothing. So if you see people at like quote unquote Renaissance fairs in a corset, no man, they wouldn't have worn a corset. It wasn't a thing that they did. They had comfy clothes. So if you want to reenact, you know, go to the middle ages because it's a lot more comfortable than steampunk, I think. <laughs> yeah, it sure sounds like it. I guess you've already mentioned a, a few of the different myths, but do you have some of these really pervasive myths that keep going about the medieval age that you want to sort of debunk a little bit? Oh my gosh, we don't have time for all of them. Um, <laughs> the first one being the flat earth. You got to start with the flat earth. Everybody knew the earth was a sphere. I don't need to go over it again. You can watch my TED Talk, there's pictures. Everyone knew it was a sphere. So that's one. Um, Another one is the chastity bell. The chastity bell did not exist. It was not a thing. I think someone might have thrown out a joke about that one. That'd be great when we go off to battle. So that's another thing. I don't know if that is too R-rated for your listeners, but that was not a thing. Um, another thing is uh, torture. So um, torture is not something that was done all the time. And it was something that was done only under certain circumstances and only in certain places and only at certain times. So um, people were not torturing each other. Um, and if you did in the Middle Ages, you didn't need to have these elaborate devices. So like the Iron Maiden, that is a Victorian fake. The Pair of Anguish, that's Victorian fake. Like 
Um, the Scold's Bridal, that's early modern. That's not medieval. Um, these things, they're not, they're not medieval, but they really stem from the fact that we think that we are so sophisticated that we had to have come from a place of brutality. So things were so much worse back then. Um, there's, it also comes from the fact that uh, after the Reformation, which is in the early 1500s, um, the Protestants really had to show how different they were from the Catholics. And in the Middle Ages, there was no Protestant Catholic. It was a form of religion that that um, most closely resembled Catholicism. So, you know, the Protestants are saying at the time they were Catholic, they were superstitious, they were brutal and savage. This is why you have torture devices. But if someone wanted to torture you in the Middle Ages, it doesn't take a lot. Our human bodies are fragile, right? So people didn't torture each other all the time. They only did that, like I said, under certain circumstances. For example, you couldn't torture someone if only one person had accused them of something. You couldn't torture them unless it was a really big crime. And also in places like England, it wasn't allowed. Torture was illegal because people knew that under torture, you'd say anything. And they were actually really invested in justice. They weren't invested in hurting people. They wanted to find out the truth. And if you can't find the truth out through torture, why would you do it? So um, I remember looking back on, again, since 14th century, this is when the Templars were arrested. Um, and the King of France, was, he really wants to destroy the Templars in part because he owed them a lot of money. So let's not forget about that. This is not all about heresy and things like that. So he was torturing Templars in France because he wanted them to admit to things that he could then prosecute. But Edward II, who is the King of England, refused for the longest time because in England, this is not what we do. Um, so there's that. It's it's important to distinguish between torture and punishment. Punishment is a different thing. This is, you know, you've you've been found guilty. And in that case, you do need to be punished. So people think of like lopping off arms all the time or throwing people in Iron Maidens. It's not how it was. And people are even executed much less often than you see in the movies. So people are a lot more dedicated, like I say, to justice and fairness than we see now, in part because people are people are more fair than we might imagine. The other reason is uh, it was a time when not everybody was super religious, but religion was a lot bigger than it is today, I think, in people's everyday lives. And if they led to something that that killed someone or hurt somebody, they had to answer to God for that. So they were much more reticent about hurting people than we think. Was it a more brutal time? Yeah, it was, but certainly not to the extent that we think. So yeah, I mean, chastity belts, the flat earth, the torture thing, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like I could go on, but those are, I think, three of the really big ones that are really pervasive and hard to root out <laughs> despite our efforts. Absolutely. Yeah, the chastity belt never made sense. I feel like there'd be some bodily functions that just wouldn't work with it. So, you know. Yeah, that's that's why they didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit about, you know, justice. So did they have courts, you know, how did that not like in the like a king and queen sense, but like more like the justice courts, what was their systems? And I don't know if you have different countries as an example, but. Yeah. So I think that the clearest example, because I'm imagining most of your, uh, your listeners are English speakers. So we'll, we'll use England because that is a good case study. So earlier in the Middle Ages, they did have trial by ordeal and they did have trial by combat. So trial by ordeal is when you would put somebody through a difficult task, usually painful. Um, and depending on how that turned out, then that was God's verdict on it. So you have um, the ones that people associate with witch trials. Again, witch trials are not really a medieval thing. They're mostly an early modern thing. Um, the Salem ones, for example, uh, they weren't even in North America till the very end of the Middle Ages. But anyway, I'm digressing. So uh, one might be you get uh, you have to hold a hot iron in your hand um, as part of your ordeal. And if it heals cleanly, then you're innocent. God has said you're innocent. Again, with with um, the water one, a priest would bless uh, a specially made pit. So not just a lake or something. Bless this water. And of course, it would become holy water once it's blessed. And if the water accepted you. So if you went down into the water, then you're innocent if they could fish you out in time, if you floated, then you're guilty. So, but 
obviously they knew at the time, just as we know now, that it's pretty easy to cheat the system. And if you had trial by combat, you could hire a champion to take care of business for you. Sometimes it was part of a plea bargain. You know, you could get a criminal to fight for you. <laughs> um, and people knew you could game the system. So the Pope actually outlawed trial by ordeal in 1215 as part of the Fourth Lateran Council. So you, you weren't really supposed to do that. Were people still doing it? Sort of, but not really. Um, they were starting to try things in a court, like you say. And um, in the in the twelfth century, you have Henry II, who's the dad of King Richard and King John, and he was trying to really um, make the law so that it not only applied to everybody, but so that it was more fair. So this is before twelve fifteen, when when the ordeals are officially. Um, ended. So he's trying to make it so that everybody has the same law. So this is because there was one law, the king's law for the regular people, and there is one law for the clergy. So the clergy were not, um, they were punished in ways that were different. So the king might take a hand in some cases, he might hang you. Um, this could not be done to clergy. The clergy took care of their own. So this means that if you were a murderer, for example, you would be s sent to the king's justice. If you're a regular person, you would die. You'd hang for that. But if you were a clergyman, you wouldn't. You'd have to, you know, do penance and stuff. And so sometimes it's really clever to show that you were a priest or a, a clerk and you, you shouldn't be subject to the king's justice. You might have just memorized the Lord's Prayer in Latin to prove that you're a priest. And so people would be like, you know, you'd be in, in trouble for murder, for example, and you start like spouting off the Lord's Prayer in Latin to show that you're really subject to the church's justice. Well, a king like Henry found this is not fair. He wanted to bring everybody together under the same law, like I'm saying. So this is why he had this conflict with Thomas Beckett, where Thomas Beckett ends up martyred. He put Thomas Beckett into the archbishopric so that he would work with him to make this law all one. And once he was Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Beckett was like, no, I think that we should still have a church law. At which point Henry gets really frustrated over time. And then, you know, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? Thomas ends up martyred. But during Henry's time, he's really, really invested in making sure that things are fair. And he really makes sure that, that jury trials are a thing. So he starts to structure jury trials. He makes this happen more often. So people are tried by a jury of their peers. And it's Henry's son, John, who has the Magna Carta forced on him. And part of this is to be tried by a jury of your peers. And this doesn't mean that everybody's equal. This means that if you're an Earl, you think that only Earls should be able to judge you. So that's in Magna Carta, which is not quite as equalizing as we think. But this idea of a trial where you're judged by your peers instead of by an ordeal is something that we are, we're still seeing today. So we're still seeing we have a judge, we have juries. This is something that people had in the Middle Ages. And that was because they wanted it to be fair. They wanted to have witness testimony, forensic testimony. They had these things as part of trials because they wanted to be as fair as possible. So the justice system is very complicated in that you do have the separate church laws and the king's law, but uh, it becomes, it resembles more of our way of doing things now during the Middle Ages. So <laughs> that's like to make a short answer long. <laughs> That's that's kind of it's like the broadest strokes of how medieval justice worked. Well, I mean, all of it seems very complex. Doesn't matter what time period you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so you gave me a crazy but true fact about you, and I'd love it if you could share it with us. Yeah. So the crazy but true fact about me is I actually have a brown belt in Krav Maga, which is a it's a not a martial art, it's a combat system, but I, I like to fight people in my spare time. So I like a bookish person who researches like medieval stuff. And what I do in my spare time is I fight my friends. So I, I do self-defense and I actually have a brown belt, which I am proud of. I've worked hard towards. And once we get to be able to like go back into gyms and stuff, I'll be working towards my black belt and that. So yeah. I don't think you picture that when you picture like nerds, but that, that is what I do for fun. <laughs> That's really amazing. I would love to learn Aikido just so I can play with swords. <laughs> 
right? It would be fun. Oh my goodness. And I like to ask this question. So if you had a time machine and you could come back safely, you're not going to get the Black Plague and, you know, all of that. Where would you want to go? Maybe who would you want to meet? What event would you want to see? You know, do you have a specific time or place or person in mind? Okay, so with the understanding that I have all my shots <laughs> and I have the correct clothing because, you know, when people talk about time machines, like I have a shaved head, I have very, very short hair and that would either mean I was a nun or an adulteress. So, <laughs> so assuming <laughs> like a, a new nun or an adulteress. So assuming that I have the right clothing, I would like to visit the 14th century. But in terms of someone I'd like to meet, the person I'd probably like to meet is Christine de Pizan, who was writing at the end of the 14th century, uh, just because she's super cool. So I'm not, I imagine most of your listeners won't know her, but she basically wrote, well, her, her biggest bestseller, I think, was The City of Ladies, which is a book that is totally written to work against all these misogynistic ideas of women that people, people had. So she wrote this entire book that is all full of like, women are great. We are so powerful. Here are all the examples from the Bible, from ancient Greece, from today, where you can see like women are just amazing. And uh, so I would like to meet her because she was not only, you know, someone who's writing stuff that was very positive in terms of like women, but also somebody who was probably the first professional female writer that we know of. So she was widowed when she was young and she made her living from writing, which is something that is really difficult at this time for even men to do. So I'd really like to sit down with her and just talk over like how, how her life went. Cause she had some really interesting struggles. She lived through a lot of interesting stuff and uh, she had the fortitude to write about in defense of women when it was a time you wouldn't be burned at the stake for it. I should be clear about that. But it was a time when that was uh, unpopular. And so to talk with her and, and find out more about her life and her courage would be something I'd like to do. Yeah, she is a quite a fascinating figure. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, she's amazing. Yeah. I just want to thank you so much, Danielle, for coming on the podcast and telling us all about the medieval world and everyday lives and women and the justice system. These are all things that I think we don't always consider. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And of course, I could talk about the Middle Ages all day. So thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> and you also wrote a book. So did you just want to mention it a little bit? And I'll put all the info in the show notes. Sure. The most recent book is Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction. So this is a book that I've structured to answer people's questions. So the table of contents is all questions. And I'm hoping that people, when they pick it up, they can just read it start to finish because they find it interesting or they can just kind of mine it for the stuff that they're interested in. So yeah, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. This was such a fun interview. I really appreciate all your insight into this medieval history. And I encourage everybody to pick up her book, there will be many links in the show notes and in the blog post, so don't forget to check it out. You can find me on social media at History, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the website, history.com. If you have a moment, I would really love it if you could rate this podcast on your podcasting platform of choice. Apparently, it helps people find me, and I really appreciate all your efforts towards this. I would like to thank my husband, Jamie, our brood of kids, our family, our friends, and the teachers who have helped me in this journey. Without you, I would not be adventuring through history. Un grand merci.